Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Pip People in Property. Today I'm pleased to say that we've got an accountant that does property accounting as well. She's also one of our landlords and she's from Majors Accounts. So Ariona, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, it's nice to see you. How was the journey down? Hi Adil, thank you so much for having me. Not too bad, some roadworks, but no, not too bad. Managed to get here in time. Um, so as you said, my name's Ariona. I'm the Managing Director of Majors Accounts and Co LTD. We're a small family run practice, not too far from yourselves. Yeah, and literally around the Creamer, like 10 minutes away. Um, yeah, so we've been trading for the last 17 years. Um, over that time, we started from a one-man band. So it was my dad actually that started the practice. I was 13 at the time. <laughs> so I was his part-time. <laughs> Helping with the paperwork. When it was like in paper form, right? Before computers and stuff. Everything was fully, you know, paper form. Um, so every Saturday, weekend, holidays, you name it, I was there. Um, so it's called Majors Accounts because my dad was a major of the army. Um, so hence why we took that name. And you can imagine Albania, right? Albania. Yeah. So you can imagine what it's like working for a major, yeah. living with a major. Regimented, I was assuming. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, you know, from a young age, I was kind of learning the ropes um, from scratch, you know, uh, as, as we said, everything paper-based, very manual. So I really got to learn the processes really well. Um, and when I got to 18, it was a decision of, do I go to uni or do I sit in my professional paper exams? Now, usually most people go to uni because there's yeah. quite a big jump between the two. Um, but my dad, obviously being my dad, said, go straight for it. Why are you going to waste time at uni? Yeah. So I was like, okay, cool. So at 18, I started my professional uh, exams whilst working really? alongside and didn't realize how difficult it was going to mm -hmm. be, but an amazing experience nevertheless. It, it was great, you know, that having that experience with the theory coupled together, I think just made the whole experience so much better. Um, and then I took over the practice in 2019 officially, although I had started a few years to implement some strategies in place. So I decided to go digital as a firm. Yeah, I think that was one of the most important things that you did really coming away from the paper and going digital. Matt, it was a huge, huge decision, that transformation. When you take over a practice, because a lot of people may start their practice from digital and you start with those processes and then decide of what technology am I going to add to make sure that we have proper systems in place. But I'm taking over a practice that has thousands of clients, a team of 25, mm -hmm. um, clients that are used to working in a manual Whoa. way and a team that's also used to working in that a way. A big change for everybody. A massive change. And it was a business that was profitable, right? So I come along one day and go, hey guys, so we're going to completely disrupt the business, um, yeah. destroy it, pick it apart, mm -hmm. redo all of our processes and add tech. And basically what you're doing today, you're not going to be doing anymore. Yeah. You can imagine that was a... a Some people were like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> when I when I said that to people, they were like, okay, she's grown two heads. It's like, that. that's the way that they were looking at me. Like, she's lost her mind. Um, but I really believed in kind of this journey. Um, and apart from this, I also studied uh, to do a master's in law, in accounting and finance. Um, and then I also did a uh, postgraduate diploma at the University of Oxford. So you're very well educated all round. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. No. I hope I didn't waste all those hours. <laughs> no, but it was an enjoyable experience, uh, I mean, throughout. But it was, I think, getting different areas so in law, in finance uh, and strategies and things like that. Being able to then use that knowledge yeah. within the business and then with our clients' businesses too. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of accountants actually they don't see their business as a business. They're so focused on their clients yeah. only they forget that. Hold on, I'm actually running a business too. So I really wanted to ensure that we were running at the most efficient, um, kind of in the most efficient way to then know that actually we can service those clients based on what we're doing. We have more time to look into what what is their business doing. I don't. I didn't want to be the typical accountant where you go once a year, yeah. you give them the paperwork, you get your accounts, they tell you what the tax figure is and it's like, okay, see you later, you know, see you next year kind of thing. Um, I really wanted to go deeper into the business and make a difference for our clients and be an integral part of that. So when we do the accounts, not a case of here, here's the tax, but how have you done them this year? How's it going now? And with the tech that we've adopted, we're able to see in real time yeah. what are our clients doing. We're not waiting nine months after the year end. At the end of the day, if it's nine months after, what can I do? Damage might have already been done to the business. Might be on a fa they might be on a downward slope and back to crash and burn. 
And we're already nine months into the second year. So I've only got about three months left to... Try and save the day. <laughs> okay. So now what we do, seeing as we've got rid of all the manual data yeah. entry, we've got more time to add that value to our really? clients. You know, So we're focusing on um, them providing us paperwork now. So if they if they go to a shop, for example, they'll buy something, they'll snap a receipt, we get it within seconds. And we're able to then code that, put it where it needs to be, and keep an eye on everything and make sure that everything is making sense. There are many times now where we may be closing a month end, for example, and we'll see that something doesn't make sense. Either we need to um, make this aware to the business owner to say, do you know what's going on in your business? Is this what it should be? Or actually, most times it's, I forgot to give you that one, so I'll give it to you now. Yeah. But at least we're sorting that out now and not a year later when they say, well, where am I supposed to find that now? I've lost it or you know, I can't I've remember. Lost it. Or I can't... There's no chance, you know? And potentially them losing um, kind of tax savings that they could have had if we didn't have it in place. But also, if they're about to make a decision of, I've got this money, what do I do with it? Yeah. Could I buy property? Can I afford to take on an extra employee? Can I invest in something else? Well, actually, we have the figures right now, so we can see what you're doing and we can put some projections in place. Well, if you do this, this is what will happen. Can your business take that or not? Can you afford it? So you've got a foresight to be able to do that because you've got the information in front of you. Exactly. So it's now our requirement of client has changed as well. Um, so we are now looking for clients, one that will work with us in this way, and those that are happy for us to communicate with them on a regular basis um, because we want to make that difference. If we're, if someone is not happy to, happy to you know, speak to us, you're not going to be able to help them anyway. You know, you're here to sort of help them make savings and make sure that their business doesn't doesn't fail essentially, which um, most accountants don't do. So that's a sort of good that's that's good on your part, um, and and good that you sort of progress your family business. I'm sure your dad is very proud of you. Now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the journey was pretty difficult because you can imagine it as his baby, right? So of course, if I'm going to come along and I'm his daughter, second generation, saying that I think I know better, I want to do it like this. Well, actually, no, I've built this business from nothing. Yeah. Um, and you're going to come along and destroy it. <laughs> That's essentially what he saw it as. And it was something that was quite progressive. And when we started, there were hardly any accountants doing this. No. And it was something that was so different that it just didn't seem to make sense. You know, it's understandable from his point of view. If clients are used to, we've trained them to work in this way. Yeah. They're not going to want to change. But they're saying that the ones that don't like change probably aren't the right business people to do business with because you want people that are going to excel and grow because then that will help you guys grow as well. But if they don't want to excel and grow and make change, they're probably a bit negative and, you know, they'll stay the same. And when, when the market ch essentially changes and we have, you know, these kind of situations where you have interest rate rises and cost of living crisis and stuff like that, their businesses may not make it through. Or a pandemic. Oh, but, oh, that's it. That's it. And that affected all those businesses. Huge thing. And this is what I think we had a massive cluster in the pandemic. There are actually some statistics where some accountants, a lot of them actually, furloughed 80% of their staff. And for me, I don't understand how that worked because for us, we were working at 100% flat out, probably more than that. Yeah. And if we weren't there for our clients, what would they have done in terms of all of the legislation changes and being able to apply apply for different loans and grants and things like that? They were calling us nonstop. You know, there was one point where I was working twenty hours a day because the majority the the working hours were taken up taken up by people calling and saying, "Oh my gosh, what do I do?" Panicking, right? Yeah. So we acted almost like um, therapists to them to say, <laughs> "It's okay, we've got this. We're applying on your behalf. This is what you're going to get." But at that time, let's say we had 2,000 clients. Mm. It's if, a lot to deal with. If they're calling us nonstop, then we're spending all of our time on phone calls. So a lot of the time we were working. And you're not your whole team can obviously deal with that. It's maybe like the, the highest senior ranking was like yourself, your dad, and maybe two or three other, other teams. Whereas, yeah, that's why you're working hours. But yeah, we're crazy. But we had the tech in place. Our team could just carry on working from home. Brilliant. We had no stop. In fact, we were working more hours than usual. So... Um, I think that's one of the things where, you know, us as a business and, and the team as well valued the fact that, you know, we became digital just in time. 
because if you hadn't done that, you again, you guys would have struggled and, and might not have been able to keep up with what you were doing. You probably wouldn't have been able to keep up. We wouldn't have been able to because the team couldn't have come into the office, right? They weren't allowed. One, one we by one. Exactly. One by one. One by one. There are actually some stories of accountants, instead of going digital, they built a conservatory on the outside of their office and they had clients putting in paperwork and they'd leave them there for two days so no one has touched them and then they'd go in and collect the paperwork. So it it's crazy. I mean, people have to do something to, to keep going, right? But that's where we had our advantage. Our clients were in the know, everything was getting done and they were able to kind of, we were able to help them through that difficult period. I think this actually comes on, we've got a couple of questions basically as well, but I think this comes on to sort of really well into one of the questions and it sort of maybe sort of answers part of it in relation to um, sort of how you stay current with changes in tax laws and regulation on the impact in property investment accounting because it's this whole digital thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is, this is something that's huge actually. Um, not many people, unfortunately, and strangely don't know about it. It's called making tax digital. So this started actually quite a few years ago. But it affected the larger companies who were VAT registered and they had to ensure that the way that they sent their paperwork to HMRC changed. They had to use digital tools, which they weren't using before, um, so to get them on that digital journey. And it meant that every quarter the information had to be submitted to HMRC in a digital format. So meaning you have to have your receipts and everything in some kind of digital format. Um, but now we're getting to the point where all of those companies or individuals that were VAT registered have got used to this now. HMRC are now moving to individuals and landlords. So the self-employed and landlords who are used to submitting generally everything once a year. Yeah. Right? So you go see your accountant, you'd give them the paperwork yeah. in paper format mostly. Uh, <laughs> plastic envelope wallets or envelopes, that's it. Um they prepare a set of accounts, tell you this is how much it is, you'll pay, you won't see them again for another year. Well, actually, now that's going to need to be submitted every three months. So you have to see your accountant, collate all your paperwork. You won't have nine months like they they have now to prepare the paperwork. So every three months, as soon as the month is up, you've got, I think it's going to be about five weeks to submit. So you've got five weeks to collect the paperwork, get the mini accounts essentially done um, and submit it to HMRC. Now, at the moment, they're not saying the tax needs to be paid then. Um whether that will come in later probably something they'll implement it slowly you know i wouldn't be surprised exactly um but it will mean that if you don't submit by that time you will face penalty yeah so the other thing is to consider for those landlords especially who have properties in joint names for example with their partner if um your part you, you do have that set up you will both need to do the exact same thing so you both need to have different submissions so you're essentially doing the work twice, kind of. Yeah. Um, so it's ensuring that you've got the systems in place from now so there isn't a huge kind of shock to the system yeah. when you are, when it's law. So it was supposed to come in actually in this April, but they have extended it to next April because so many people were not ready. And I think HMRC's infrastructure, infrastructure was... It wasn't ready as well. Exactly. I've been lucky enough to... Because I'm also um, part of my uh, association, so the board who give us our license to, to trade... Uh, which is the ACCA. Um, I'm also a member, a UK Practitioners Network panel member, so I'm the vice chair for that. And uh, I was lucky enough to speak to the MTD task force at the people who are implementing this. Guys, MTD is making tax, di tax digital, just so you know. Yeah, sorry, I should, I should have clarified. <laughs> um, so they have said that they will not postpone again unless there is another pandemic where it's at the end of the world. Well, hopefully we're not having either of those because... But it's not. Yeah, I think if any of those happens, I don't think we're going to be worried about it making test digital, right? Um, so the idea is that they are really kind of focused on putting this in place and it's just going to be a huge shift for so many people. So that means from now on, you need to ensure that you've got your paperwork in a digital format. So we're working with our clients. We've actually started already. Um, and have been for nearly a year. So by the time it does become legislation, they're used to two years of doing this, so there is no difference. So we're putting in technology in place that will allow um, our clients, especially landlords, to connect up their bank accounts, to connect to their estate agents, to connect to so many different um, third parties, to put everything in one place so we're actually able to see in real time. And when it's the end of the year, we're able to say, okay, this is what we've got. Does it make sense? Could we be missing anything? Let's submit. That's the kind of thing we're going to be doing every three months. 
and as a landlord yourself as well, it also helped because you've got the knowledge from the accountancy side and all the, all the legal know-how about all of that, but you're a landlord, so you want to make sure that you're on point, you're, you know, you're getting everything done perfectly, not just for your clients as well, but just so you've got peace of mind as well. Well, exactly. well. I think as a firm as well, over the years, we've dealt with so many businesses and individuals within the property sector, whether that's property developers, yeah. whether it's construction companies or professionals, as architects, engineers. Yeah um and plumbers and and so on so we've got you know an idea of all across the board yeah. and us as well so we do property development and your brother handles that side of the home isn't it yeah 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 no so so we do a, a bit of that you know double it in that ourselves as well so we've really got that full all-rounded understanding and that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to niche in as a business we do have other clients as well so our hospitality is also a big sector for them yeah. but it's something that if we've got all the contacts and we've seen first-hand areas of that business and how they function and why they function a certain way um you know where they buy everything and who they sell to and you know how the solicitors deal with everything and stuff like that then um why not start to, to help do you think do you think that making the tax digital side of things is so they can monitor people more and sort of keep track of what they're doing and can't sort of hide not hide but use loopholes maybe as such absolutely i think one of the things is right now obviously people have got nine months after the year end to kind of figure out what's happened in the last year yeah whereas when that comes into place you've got three months to figure out what's going on after three months it's submitted and you can't go back tracking or anything like that i'll go back tracking because if you do then hmrc will say okay you resubmitted this what was the reason for that yeah and why did you do that so it's going to make everybody really get in line and make sure that... really regimented exactly so if your, dad, if your dad might like that i think yes <laughs> i think he will <laughs> but it, it just means that you have to plan yeah plan for the future makes sense now what strategies uh and i know this is this is not gonna be like a one blanket for all so this is sort of like um maybe like different strategies work for different people so guys at home please don't take this as specific advice for yourself particularly always speak to your accountant and obviously you haven't got a good one or you haven't got one Please reach out to Ariola. She'll be more than happy to help you. But what strategies would you recommend for maximizing returns on property investment from a, from a tax perspective? Yeah, so with this, we have clients that will come to us and say, right, we're, we're looking at investing in property, but we don't know how to set ourselves up. So the first kind of conversations that we will have with them are, what is your goal, end goal? Are you doing this because you've seen a property and you'd like to just do it once and you think you'll make some money from it, but you're not planning to do it again? Or is this something that, actually you want to double more in you want to build a portfolio is it something that you want to kind of take property and earn rentals and leave it there essentially and let it carry on earning rentals so that when it comes to you know pension that is your pension and that's what you're going to be living on um or is it something that you want to leave to your children um so or do you want to develop and build that property portfolio and then work on large scale projects. Yeah. So it really depends on on what they want to do. You know, if someone is only looking to do it once um, or it's from their own property, say they have their property, they've been living there for a while and they've seen that actually, I think I can develop next door. They've got a garage, they want to turn it into a, a house or whatever. Then um, there's no point in them setting up a limited company, for example. Um, because they wouldn't be considered as traders. It was a once-off, so they'll pay some yeah. capital gains tax um, on that. And there, there are ways, obviously, of trying to mit mitigate that. If they decide to rent it out as a furnished holiday let, then when they sell, capital gains tax can be reduced from the 18 or 28%, depending on their income, to possibly 10 um, and then if they then decide to do do that going forward, then that can be mitigated to zero and rolled over into the next property. Um, however, there are those that do want to do this more long term and they do want to earn more money. Um, then a special purpose vehicle like a limited company, yeah. you know, is something that they really should be looking into. Uh, the other thing is, is considering if you're kind of which areas you're planning to, to invest in. So we've got clients that they are looking to invest their money and they want to earn as much as possible yeah. in terms of the, the cash flow income. Yeah, just, just to have something there in, in the background, right? They're not going to be investing in areas like London for that because the amount of capital that you're putting up initially 
for that property and the mortgage that is going to be on there, yeah. the amount you're left over is not going to be huge. Yeah. So they will look to invest, for example, up north <laughs> in areas like Birmingham or Liverpool, Manchester, yeah. where they don't need to put up as much money initially, but actually the rental value, uh, the cash flow is really good for the amount, so the amount of capital that has been employed there. However, if they're looking to do property development, it's not something that they're going to go up north mm. for because the property prices are so much lower. Yeah. Uh, but materials are the same everywhere. And equity growth is not as great. You can't really add much value unless something is like really, really down and out. And then, you know, that might make a difference. But it's highly unlikely, yeah. as you say. So that's something that they would be doing here. And then some will also structure it in a way where they will have rental properties in one company, for example, and then companies that they're developing in another or if they're planning to um, go into a joint venture with somebody. So obviously, if you put your money together, you can yeah. probably do a lot more. Um, so again, they will set up a company with split ownership um, and move on that way. Because there are some people that have got joint ventures with so many different people. Yeah. and you. We've got some you clients like that, to be honest with you. And when we do a, like a sale or we sell them something, they're like, oh, this is going in. The, and they're giving me a different company name and there's a different directors and shareholders. Exactly. And it changes all the time. But that's not something that's, that's that's necessarily a bad thing. It just means that you can get your hand in more than one pie and you can maybe generate more income as such. It's not just that, but you will have people that will have different risk appetites. So if you find somebody that you're going to go into a joint venture with, they want to invest a lot, for example, in a particular project, then you've got that set up in a special purpose vehicle, so a limited company. However, you meet somebody else, they're not related. They One, one of them wants to kind of invest some money but doesn't want anything huge then you can invest in something with them that low risk as such yeah. yeah so it's making sure that you've got everything tidy and split so there are no kind of blurred lines of people saying well, why i don't want to invest in that i want to do this or it, it gives you that ability to split that up and also in the future if you want to sell something you can sell a project with the yeah. company you don't need to go through that whole like, oh, okay i've got to try and figure out how do i extract this particular property or project out of this company without disrupting other things and so it just makes everything so much easier to offload and come out yeah it makes sense that's thank you for that um how would you evaluate financial performance of a property investment and like what metrics would you essentially use yeah so as we've discussed that i mean the main one for our clients is the return on the capital employed so how much are you getting based on what you've put up up front and also the risk appetite of the investor whether they're risk averse or, or not so um but the main one is based on what i'm investing what am i getting back is this project worth it or not and if they if they are looking more long term they may not mind not getting kind of huge um benefits now because they're looking more long term makes sense makes sense now, a bit on a foot for yourself as a personal sort of uh, thing. What would, obviously, I know you've got a couple of properties yourself in your sort of, you've built a portfolio, a small portfolio. Would you see yourself getting into developments more or would you see yourself maybe buying more buy-to-lets for holiday? What, where do you see yourself going with property? That's a good question. It's a good question. I think that obviously property development, as as a person, I love it. Um, and I think that kind of stems through what I've done with the business as well. Yeah. I've essentially taken it destroyed it pulled it apart and made something new yeah. and that's kind of what you do with property development right you'll take a property you either knock it down completely or put it, it out. exactly and so I, I really do love that process with that obviously you need higher amounts of capital but the benefits are so much higher so that's something that i'd love to get involved um in more to be honest but i think um rental as well is something that's nice to have there in the background but that's something that you, for a longer term let's say like a pension pot type thing in the future also for children for example you could put that if i wanted to invest and leave something ready for my kids for when either they go to uni or whatever so that's something that we can put into um, a pension scheme and it's sitting there earning them money rather than putting the money in a bank account and earning nothing, nothing essentially <laughs> so I, I think a mixture of both is, is something that I like to get involved in because you've already done a bit of both. So you've got the the you know apartments and stuff, and then you recently done the you bought your house and really nice, and then you've done that really big development, which unfortunately was a little bit of a bumpy road for you with the planning, uh, from what I recall. Um, but it was a good journey. It was a good journey in terms of I learned a lot. When they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? So I was just unlucky that it happened just before COVID. Everything got delayed. 
Uh, it was just one thing after another. But there were things that I learned along the way which I, I never knew before. So now if I was to start something else, I know how to go about it better. Yeah. Um, so it was a learning curve. So in the end, I enjoyed it because it works out right. It works out well, yeah, of course. And you know what, as you say, you know, although it was difficult times for you and you went through the thick of it as such, I don't think you could have had a worse time because you was going through COVID. You had some difficult neighbours, let's say, um, and the planning was kept getting knocked back, but one at a time rather than all in one go. So you faced the worst of it. I, 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 Interest rate rises. Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> all kinds of things, basically. So they all piled up. So you, look, you, you, you're, you're strong-willed, strong-minded. You've got the knowledge and the know-how. Um, and you've, you've displayed that from not just the accountancy firm, but from the, the property side of things as well. Um, look, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been great to have you. Um, guys, if you need any advice, I'm going to put all the details for Majors Accountants and Ariona in the description. Um, and you can always get in touch. Also, tag in over all the information, website, emails, all that kind of stuff. Um, feel free to contact them uh, and they'll be able to help you. Again, it's not just for property guys as well. I know we're doing a people and property podcast, but they cover all wide range uh, of, of sectors, um, hospitality they mentioned and so on. So yeah, thank you very much for watching everybody and I hope to see you on the next one.